for the last 20 years of your life. Ihdina. How did Allah answer dua? How did He guide us to the straight path? The next surah, Surah Al-Baqarah, tells us exactly how. Alif Lam Mim. ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدى للمتقين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين All praise and thanks belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and may the peace and blessing of Allah be upon his servant and final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as to what follows, my dear respected brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It is a uh, great blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we are gathered here this evening in one of the most beloved places to Allah azza wa jal, and that is Al Masjid. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our gathering and to forgive our sins and our shortcomings. My brothers and sisters in Islam, this evening's lecture is titled The Reminder, Al Dhikra. With Dhikra, of course, this is the word that Allah Azza wa Jal chose to describe the Quran. So, inshallah ta'ala, this evening's lecture is going to be about the greatest revelation that Allah Azza wa Jal revealed to mankind Al Quran and what attitude and what relationship is the believer supposed to have with the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But at the beginning, I want to share with you a narration of, of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, he narrates and he says that in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he once said to Jibreel, well hadith is in Sahih al-Bukhari, he said to him, مَا مَنَعَكَ أَن تَزُورَنَا أَكْثَرَ مِمَّا تَزُورَنَا The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says to Jibreel alayhi salam, what prevents you from visiting us more than you already visit us? You see the love of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his attachment to the Qur'an because Jibreel only comes down with the word of Allah azza wa jal. And Jibreel is coming regularly. He's coming down almost every second day, every third day, once a week or whatever it is. He's coming down regularly with the word of Allah Azza wa Jal. Yet even then, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would say to Jibreel, what's holding you? What's holding you back? What is preventing you from visiting us more than you already visit me? Come more. Come with some more Quran. Make these visits often. Make them daily, make them hourly. So Jibreel alayhi salam, he says, and this is what Allah azza wa jal says in the Quran, وَمَا نَتَنَزَّلُ إِلَّا بِأَمْرِ رَبِّكَ لَهُ مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِينَا وَمَا خَلْفَنَا وَمَا بَيْنَ ذَلِكَ وَمَا كَانَ رَبُّكَ نَسِيَّا In response to the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's invitation, Allah azza wa jal would reveal in Surah Maryam, that Jibreel would then say to the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَمَا نَتَنَزَّلْ إِلَّا بِأَمْرِ رَبِّكَ We'd love to come and visit you. But me, Jibreel alayhi salam, and us, all the angels, we only come down by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the idea of this hadith, it's teaching you and I what type of love and what type of eagerness the believer is supposed to have in terms of his relationship with the Qur'an. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam before a dhikra came down, before the Qur'an came down, he described him with one word, and that is in Surah Al-Duha. Allah azza wa jalla, he said, وَوَجَدَكَ ضَالًا That's the state of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam before the revelation of the Qur'an. وَجَدَكَ ضَالًا ضَالًا meaning he's seeking. He's seeking, he's finding, he's looking for something. He doesn't have the answers to life. He doesn't know the purpose yet. He's looking for something ضالًا. Like someone has lost a camel, and the camel is his only ride and only mode of transport. He's lost. And you know, a lost person, you can tell, you immediately 
see him and recognize him is looking for something, you immediately say, are you looking for something? Have you lost anything? That's how Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is described before the Quran came down. And all of a sudden, Fahada, he guided. How did the transition happen? How did he go from a state of ضالن to Hada, having guidance, having purpose in life, having meaning in life, walking on a straight path? How, how did this happen? How can it happen? Through the wahi, through the revelation. The Quran came down and it shifted his life from a state of ضالن to a state of Hada. Allahu Akbar. And so this is it. This is the solution for mankind and solution for all world problems. Today, how much dalal is on earth? How much misguidance is on earth, right? How much? The earth is full with misguidance. Misguidance in belief, right? With all the isms that are out there and being promoted and pushed, whether it's in society, out and about, or in the universities, or on school grounds, whether it's online or in the cafes, or on podcasts, whatever it is. Everyone wants to run his mouth and his tongue speaking about Allah. Let's debate Allah. Let's debate Allah. Does he exist? Does he, does he not exist? Well, this is dalal. This is misguidance. The prophets would come to their people and say to them, Afillahi shak. To your people, there's something wrong here. Afillahi shak. Is this topic even up for debate? Is there doubt in Allah? Afillahi shakkun fatiris samawati wal ard. While he is the one who originated and created the heavens and the earth. He said, just look at the heaven and the earth. That's enough. That's enough for you to know that Allah exists since he's the creator of all of this. Right? This is the state of our people today. Ballan. Lost, misguided. Through doubts, through desires, through temptations, through al fitan What's the solution for mankind? It's the same for the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's the same thing. Nothing changes. Fahada, fahada bil Qur'an. He guided you through the Qur'an, through the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al Qur'an, my brothers and my sisters in Islam, yani, in Surah Al-Rahman, you all know Surah Al-Rahman. The ayah that is repeated often in Surah Al-Rahman, Which of the favors of your Lord do you deny? So Surah Al-Rahman is speaking about Allah. It is speaking about the favors of Allah, the gifts of Allah. That's what it's speaking about. What is the first gift and the first favor and the first blessing? That Allah Azza wa Jal will mention in the Quran. What is it? That He will mention in Surah Al Rahman. You know what it is? Al Rahman Allam Al Quran. That's the first Allah. That's the first blessing. That is the first ni'mah that was made mention of in Surah Al Rahman. And He used His name Al Rahman first. Then Allam Al Quran. The most merciful. He taught the Quran. He didn't use any other name. He could have said, Al-Jabbar, Allam Al-Quran. He could have used Al-Jabbar, Al-Aziz, Al-Hakim, Allam Al-Quran. Al-Rahman, teaching you and I that it is from the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal that he taught mankind Al-Quran. Indeed, it is mercy. This is Allah's mercy upon mankind that he gave them medicine. He gave them a treatment. To all their ailments and all their sicknesses, whether they are physical sicknesses or spiritual diseases of the heart, that's from his mercy. The spiritual pharmacy was sent down way before mankind was created. Because this is what Allah had decreed in Allah al Mahfur. Quran was already written way before we were all created. Al Rahman Allam al Quran. Then he said, خَلَقَ insan. He created the human being. But what, did it, what came first? The creation of mankind or Allah teaching us and revealing the Qur'an to mankind? No doubt, no doubt. Allah created the human beings first. Then the Qur'an was revealed later on 
upon the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But that's not the order in the surah. The order in itself teaches you something profound. And that is that Allama al-Qur'an was the purpose of life. Al-Qur'an was the purpose of life. That is the goal. After the goal was set up and it was established, then Allah created al-insan to fulfill that Qur'an he was created for. So the one who is abiding by the Qur'an, holding on to the Qur'an and its message and its meaning, adopting it in his life, this is someone that is living his purpose on earth. And whoever is living his purpose on earth finds contentment, peace, and tranquility in his heart because he is doing what he was created for, right? This is yani, a logical understanding. You see this microphone? It's designed for me to speak in it. Then it takes my sound and it's amplified through the speaker. If I use it for what it was created for, it will remain in perfect condition. And we can use it for many years. But if I use this for other than what it was made for, right? So let's say I took it and I used it like the hammer the judge uses. And every time I wanted your attention, I will grab this and I will slam it onto the table. Give it a few weeks, a few months, it's ruined, it's destroyed, it cannot be used. When you use something for other than its purpose, you damage it. When you use something for its purpose, it will last long and it will give you the best of it. So the human being was created to fulfill the Qur'an. So when you fulfill the Qur'an in your life, you will live an optimal life. You will get the best out of your life because you're living your purpose. How many books are there today? And how many courses are there today? Sold in their thousands. Attend this seminar, attend this seminar, and this and weekend course and whatever it is. Get the, getting the best out of your life. And people line up and pay. And what do you learn? What do you learn? You sit in front of a human being that thinks, that thinks that based on his experience in life, maybe his experience is 30, 40 years. I've got it. I've got the solution, how to live a better life. And people are lining up and they're paying to hear him talk. How can I better my life from his speech? And the Quran, where is it? And the Quran is for Ramadan. Later on when Ramadan comes, we'll see what we can pick out of it. Well, the Quran is for free. وَمَا هُوَ عَلَى الْغَيْبِ بِضَنِينَ Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was never stingy, never held back. Information and knowledge, he gave it, and it's the most authentic and truthful knowledge. See the idea? إِذَنْ الرَّحْمَانْ عَلَّمَ الْقُرْآنَ And when you live your life, and you are not embracing your purpose, then you will damage yourself. Just like if I use this for other than what it was made for, it gets damaged. Now look at the people that live a life away from the Qur'an. How damaged are they? How damaged? In their spiritual health, in their physical health, in their mental health, in their financial dealings. Because if you're not upholding the Qur'an, then you will do all sorts of haram transactions. You will get yourself involved in a haram mortgage, a riba-based loan. And what has that done to people's mental health these days? How many have committed suicide? Because of a riba and a mortgage that he got stuck with, he cannot pay. Whoever was committed on the Qur'an, he'll know that this is not healthy for mankind. He'll keep away from it. His mental health and his well-being will be in top shape because he's living his purpose. So the farther away, further away you are from your purpose, the more miserable a person becomes. And that's by the word of Allah Azza wa Jal, وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِي Whoever moves away from my dhikr, from my remembrance, the Quran reminds you of Allah and your purpose, then Allah Azza wa Jal promises such a person, lahu, to him is a ma'ishatan banka, a miserable life full of trouble. And he won't find contentment in this trouble. Yes, the believer might go through trouble. And difficulty. 
But at least the one who's living with the Qur'an will find peace and tranquility through the calamities and through the troubles. He won't suffer from them. But the one who's away from the Qur'an, he will live a troublesome life, a life of misery, and he will feel every sting of it and every moment of pain. And there's nothing to guide him in terms of how to feel and how to be content during these moments. My brothers and sisters in Islam, we read Surah Al-Kahf every Friday. The first ayah in Surah Al-Kahf, Alhamdulillah, الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا. You see how Surah Al-Kahf began. Surah Al-Kahf is the surah that protects from a Dajjal, right? As the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, if a Dajjal appears before you, you didn't go to him, but he just appeared before you. فليقرأ عليه فواتيح سورة الكهف. Read upon him the opening ayat of Surah Al-Kahf, first ten ayat. And that will protect you from him. Do you know what that means? If ten ayat of Surah Al-Kahf can protect you from the greatest fitna on earth, then surely it can protect you from every fitna on earth because every fitna is less in its intensity than fitna al dajjal And the first ten ayat, the first ayah, what is it speaking about? Alhamdulillah, this is a person that is excited. This is a person that is screaming from enjoyment and happiness and excitement and delight. Someone running around and saying, Alhamdulillah. Today, when would you scream out Alhamdulillah from your heart? When you get good news. Right? Someone had a pay rise. Your wife gave birth. You finally got married. You graduated from school. You memorized the Quran and you finished it. These are ni'am, these are blessings. Alhamdulillah, finally. This is the attitude of the beginning of the surah. Someone screaming. Out of happiness, what's, what, what's the blessing that he's celebrating here? الَّذِي أَنزَلَ عَلَىٰ عَبْدِهِ الْكِتَابِ الحمد لله For the fact that Allah Azza wa Jal has revealed the book unto his slave. We're celebrating نِعْمَةُ الله, which is the Qur'an that was revealed unto the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's the attitude when you read Surah Al-Kahf from the very beginning. This is like someone that is lost in the desert and had no clue, no way how to come out. He was about to die. And all of a sudden, he found a road map that leads him out of the desert. He holds on to it. Alhamdulillah. Or like a person that is in the depth of the ocean. He looks left and right of him. Behind him, in front of him, there's only ocean and water. There is no land. He's about to drown. He's about to die. He's panicking, he's struggling. And all of a sudden a helicopter comes and deploys a life boy. And he holds on to it tightly, Alhamdulillah. This is the situation of us on this earth. We're in darkness, surrounded by waves and storms of doubts and desires and temptations. And we're about to suffer, we're about to drown. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends a rope onto earth. Al-Quran has been described as a rope. وَاَتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ Al-Quran is حَبْلُ اللَّهِ الْمَتِينَ The strong rope of Allah azza wa jal. One end of the rope is with us and the other is with Allah azza wa jal. So we're in this darkness on earth. The storms of fitan and desire and waves of desire are around us, about to crush us and destroy us. This Quran was revealed like a rope, like that life boy. You hold on to it, and this is how you're going to be saved and out of all these storms and these pressures. So this is the attitude of the beginning of Surah Al-Kahf. Alhamdulillah, الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب. وَلَمْ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ عِوَجَا And he never made for this Qur'an any crookedness. The Qur'an is not crooked. It's not deviated. Rather, it is قَيِّمًا It's straight. It is upright. 
It calls to the best of morals and values and ethics and character and dealings and everything. You know what that means? The closer you are to the Quran, the more straight your life becomes. The further away you are from the Quran, the more crooked and bent you become. This is how it is. So the relationship with the Quran, my brothers and my sisters in, in Islam, has to be strong. In Surah Al-Kahf, the last passage in Surah Al-Kahf, Allah mentioned Al-Firdaus. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ سَيَجْعَلُ لَهُمْ كَانَتْ لَهُمْ جَنَّاتُ الْفِرْدَوْسِ نُزُلًا Al-Firdaus was only mentioned twice in the Quran. This was one of them. But can you do the link between the beginning of the surah and the end of the surah? The connection is simple. The one who upholds Al-Quran in his life, it would lead him to Jannat Al-Firdaus. Al-Quran is enough to take you to the highest levels in the paradise. You don't need more than that. My brothers and my sisters in Islam, what is our relationship with the Quran? We all know the honor of the Quran and the virtue of the Quran and the importance of the Qur'an. We all know this. So recently in one of the European countries, someone burnt the Qur'an and the entire Muslim world is angry, right? And rightfully so, this is our book. We don't allow anyone to harm the book or disrespect the book or dishonor the book. Okay, that's one thing. But really, really, what is our relationship with this book? What kind of connection do we have? Wallahi, my brothers and sisters in Islam, it is disturbing to know that the greatest complaint of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the day of judgment is the relationship his ummah had with the Quran. In Surah Al-Furqan, Allah azza wa jal mentions this complaint. وَقَالَ الرَّسُولِ يَا رَبِّ إِنَّ قَوْمِ اتَّخَذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَهْجُورًا وَقَالَ الرَّسُولِ The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will say aloud, Ya Rabb, he complains directly to Allah, not to Jibreel, not to an angel, not to his companions, not to anyone, but to Allah. He is complaining. He's complaining who? Who, which people? Qawmi, my people, my nation, these people that are my followers, and the people I was sent to. Yani every mankind, every man and woman that existed after Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. My people. What happened? What's the complaint? Ittakhadhu hadha al-Qur'an mahjura. They abandoned this Qur'an. They neglected this Qur'an. They knew its importance. They knew its virtue. They're ready to defend it if it got burnt. But what did they actually have of a relationship with it? Mahjur. You know what mahjur means? It comes from the word hajara. Hajara like hijra. You know when someone does a hijra, he moves from one land all the way to another land, far away from his nest, from his origin. This is what the people did. They didn't just move away from it a little travel. They had done hijra from the Quran. This is the people that the Nabi Sallallahu is complaining about. God! Plus, he doesn't have any relationship with the Qur'an other than it's just a word. A word of Allah that was revealed, that's all I know about it. All he knows is that the Qur'an is important in Ramadan and somehow we have to read something from it in Ramadan. If someone died, that's when we have to read Qur'an. I don't know, that's what someone taught me. If someone got married, let's open up and read Al-Fatiha and watch that. Bas. That's his relationship with the Qur'an. Well, that's wrong. Even the ideas, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, and you can imagine how many years ago is Ibn al-Qayyim, how many centuries ago. He says at his time, people have abandoned and neglected the Quran in five ways. And he's basically teaching us that the relationship we're supposed to have with the Quran in five things. And he's saying people at his time abandoned the Quran in these manners. But imagine then our time. Imagine now, 
He said they have abandoned the recitation of the Quran. Allahu Akbar. They abandoned the recitation of the Quran. And they abandoned listening to the Quran because it's also a sunnah to listen to the Quran as much as you read the Quran. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to select certain sahaba and say to them, read upon me the Quran, read, read, I want to hear it from someone else. And he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would sit down and listen to the Quran from the tongue of others. People abandoned listening to the Quran. When was the last time someone sat and had just a session between him and the Quran while being played? I just listening to the word of Allah. You know, there are, because the thing is, okay, I don't understand Arabic. What am I going to listen to? You listen to the Arabic and the translation that goes with it. And there is a whole playlist on YouTube of the Quran being played, recited, an ayah in Arabic, and then the English comes after it. People abandoned listening to the Quran. People abandoned seeking treatment through the Quran. Al istishfa'u bil Quran. When someone gets sick, the first thing that we do, oh, we rush to the doctor, we rush to medicine, we rush to Google to put in our symptoms and to see what's going to come up and diagnose ourselves and see what kind of medicine we need. That's good, no problems. And I'm not cancelling that altogether. That's from the means that Allah Azza wa Jal taught mankind. But before all of this, there was a greater medicine that never goes wrong. And that is the Quran. Allah Azza wa Jal, he called the Quran, وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءً We reveal down what is of treatment and cure to mankind. al Quran is called Shifa. Shifa means treatment. He did not call it Dawa. Dawa is medicine. What's the difference between medicine and treatment? The difference is that dawa, medicine, sometimes works, sometimes it doesn't work. But a shifa, a treatment, it definitely works 100% of the times. And that's how the Quran was described. And the people have abandoned the Quran in terms of pondering and implementing its meaning. Pondering over the Quran. Doesn't mean to just sit down and read something and think about it. The highest level of pondering over the Quran is to implement. So if you read, وَأَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ means establish the salat. Then you got up and you stood in the line and you prayed salat al-maghrib. You are now pondering over the Quran. And that's the highest level of pondering over the Quran when you implement it. You read, وَآتُ zakat. And it encourages you, it inspires you to give a sadaqah. You are now implementing and pondering over the Qur'an in its highest form and level. Hassan al-Basr rahimahullah, he said, وَمَا تَدَبُّرُ آيَاتِهِ إِلَّا بِاتِّبَاعِهِ Pondering over the Qur'an is nothing but implementing the ayat. Right? If you read Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim in Surah Al-Fatiha, and it inspired you, to call out to the mercy of Allah and beg him for his mercy and forgiveness, you are now doing tadabbur of the Qur'an. If an ayah increased your love for Allah, that's pondering over the Qur'an. If an ayah increased your fear of Allah Azza wa Jal, that's tadabbur al-Qur'an. Do you understand how it works? That's tadabbur al-Qur'an. People have abandoned that. When was the last time you read an ayah and you interacted with the ayah the very second you recited it? You moved into action the very moment he recited it. This is why in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he used to night, pray the night prayers, if he read an ayah of mercy, he would ask Allah for his mercy. As he is praying the night prayer, he's implementing the Quran. And if he read an ayah of punishment, he would seek protection from Allah as he is praying. Right? This is the highest level of pondering over the Qur'an. Allah Azza wa Jal, he said to him, إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسَ يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجًا فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرْهُ إِنَّهُ كَانَ تَوَّابًا So then when he was in his ruku' he would say, سُبْحَانَكَ اللَّهُمَّ وَبِحَمْدِكْ أَسْتَغْفِرُكَ وَأَتُوبُ إِلَيْكَ In his ruku' 
Aisha radiyallahu anha, she says, يَتَأَوَّلُ الْقُرْآنِ He would say, سُبْحَانَكَ اللَّهُمَّ وَبِحَمْدِكَ اللَّهُمَّ اغْفِرْ لِي سُبْحَانَكَ اللَّهُمَّ وَبِحَمْدِكَ اللَّهُمَّ اغْفِرْ لِي Aisha said, he is interpreting the Qur'an. Allah said to him, glorify your Lord and seek his forgiveness. So he implemented it in his salat. This is pondering over the Qur'an. Simple. And the fifth way in how people have abandoned the Qur'an, التحاكم إليه To return to the Qur'an and place it as a judge in our troubles and our problems with others. And again, when was the last time? A person has an issue with someone else. Two business partners have a dispute. When was the last time you said, brother, listen, the opinion is not for you or I. Let's go to a person that is learned in the Quran and Sunnah and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we don't want his opinion, but he can explain to us what is the opinion and the judgment of Allah and his messenger in our case. And then both of us are Muslims, we will accept that. People have abandoned that. You see, if we all follow this, there will not remain a single problem on earth. But we don't follow it. And if we do, we don't follow it correctly. My brothers and my sisters in Islam, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he said people abandon the Quran in these ways. But I want to tell you something. Today, people... Or you could probably be sitting here and say, yes, well, I understand what you're saying. I know the virtue of the Qur'an. I know the importance of the Qur'an. 100%, I agree with you. No problems. But now practically there's a problem. There is actually a complaint. And that is that, okay, I'm eager. I am ready. I want to read. I want to develop this relationship. But brother, I read the Qur'an and then nothing happens. And tomorrow I'll read. And after tomorrow I'll read. And then, I tell you something. This is a big complaint. What's the solution? We're missing something. I want to share with you the solution. Wallahi, you listen to me very carefully. I'm going to tell you a few words. If you approach your recitation of the Qur'an from now on, with this approach I'm going to share with you, Wallahi, it will change your recitation of the Qur'an dramatically. Wallah, you will read the Qur'an today for the very first time as though you have never read the Qur'an before in your life. The problem is we read the Qur'an. You ask the brother, why are you reading the Qur'an? He says, 10 hasanat per letter. Okay, that's good. What else? Uh, it's the word of Allah. Okay, what else? What else? We're lost. We got no clue. The correct attitude that is a life changer is to read the Quran for guidance. To have the attitude of I want to derive my guidance from here. So that means I will read an ayah and I will stop and I will repeat it 10 times, 20 times, 100 times until I find my guidance within it. I'm not going to rush to read an entire page. La. I want to read one ayah and continue to read it until I actually find myself moving towards implementing this ayah, sourcing my guidance out of this ayah. You know, wallahi, I tell you, many, many, many Muslims have no clue that the Qur'an is to be recited for our guidance. Abdul Hamid ibn Badis, rahimahullah, a great scholar, a great scholar of Islam, he narrates his own story. He says, I went to Jamaat al zaytunah in Tunis, and I studied the tafsir of the Qur'an, tafsir al-Baydawi, professional tafsir, massive. He studied the entire Qur'an from the very beginning to the end. And he, Wallah, he said, he said, I never knew that the Qur'an was a book of guidance until later. La, why? This is a life of a student if he's not careful. He gets immersed into meanings and definitions 
what this means, why did this come before this, why came after this, or oh, picking out all these things, what tafsir, when the ayah came down, when it was revealed, onto who was it revealed, what's the story behind it, what's the history, what's seerah behind it's all good. But where's the guidance in all this? This is information. So he mastered information about the Quran, yet he failed to see that the Quran was a book of guidance. He only realized this later when he started giving lectures back in his country. And he saw the guidance that the Quran offers for mankind and their problems. I'll give you an example. You know, today, many young youth, shall I say all the people as well, not only the youth, uh, they have fallen into a satanic devilish trap. And that is being exposed consistently to adult content online. That's a problem. That's a huge disease in today's society, especially among the younger generation and also the older generation. Among man and woman, it doesn't differentiate between anyone. Huge fitna, huge disease, especially who has a smartphone. And especially if he's got social media downloaded on it and accounts open. It is very easy. To scroll through reel after reel, seeing al-haram, exposing your eyes to al-haram, the eye is committing zina at the time. Opening profiles, one after the other, no one's there. Out in the streets now, this week's been a very hot week. Literally, this is all nudity and shamelessness outside that you see. And I am being troubled by this. I as a Muslim, I'm troubled by this. What's my medicine? What's the cure? Shuf, Surah An-Nur. A quarter of an ayah would solve your problem forever. Allah Azza wa Jalla says in Surah An-Nur, قُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ يَغُضُّ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ Say, announce, tell the believers that they lower their gaze. And now, when I have a problem, I'm not able to lower my gaze from Al-Haram, I need to read the Quran and that ayah, not only for 10 hasanat per letter, but I want to read it for guidance. He, my guidance is in here. So you read, قُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ يَغُضُّ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ This is the word of Allah. This is the word of my Lord. This is the word of Allah who created the woman. And then he revealed to me the cure and the treatment. So now, I either prefer what Allah wants for me and I lower my gaze or I prefer what I want for myself and I raise my gaze. And I want guidance. I want to read the Quran for guidance. He's medicine. Allah is saying to me, lower the gaze. Now when I am trapped between me and my nafs will haram, I'm reading this ayah over and over again. Keep repeating it until you find it growing within your nafs and you find your guidance in it and you're able to follow in the instructions of Allah. And tell them also to uh, guard their privates. First Allah said, lower the gaze. Then he said, safeguard the privates. Don't commit a zina with the privates. Even though Committing a zina with the privates, it's much worse of a sin than looking. But why was looking mentioned first? Because that's the gateway to this. That is more pure for them. Allah is telling you, every time you lower your gaze, you're purifying your nafs. Nafs is being cleaned. It's being washed. It's being polished. It's becoming white. It's becoming like a crystal. ذَلِكَ أَزْكَى لَهُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ خَبِيرٌ بِمَا يَصْنَعُونَ Allah is well aware of what they do. And that is the thing that is supposed to keep you away from looking at Al-Haram. That you have the belief and the understanding that Allah is looking and well aware of what you are doing. How much is in this ayah that offers you guidance and saves you from this path of destruction? Yet, People will pay thousands and hundreds 
to do courses of how do I stop this addiction in my life? Well, here, solutions in one area. You know, there was a study that was done, I don't know, I think in the UK or in the US. They were speaking about a, a pandemic. And that is adult content that is appearing online in front of eight, nine, ten-year-old children. They're saying, this is too much. That cannot be exposed to an eight-year-old. There's still some... There's still some sense out there to say that it's wrong for 80 year olds to see that. So they went and spent millions. Allahu alam how much money they spent. Scientists, research, medicine, psychologists, doctors. Find the, let's find a solution for this problem. After millions of dollars and hours and hours of research. You know what the solution was? There was a, like a bit of a list of a recent research. But I'll tell you the first two. Number one. The instructors and the educators and the parents are supposed to teach their seven, eight, nine-year-old kids when adult content appears online, look away. She said, look away. Well, that's in the Quran. And the second thing, they should go to an adult and speak to him about that which they had seen online. And I tell you, a book of guidance. You have to read the Quran with the intention of guidance. I tell you, my brothers and my sisters in Islam, today people are tempted, they are tempted to walk into a bank and take a based, a lo an interest-based loan, right? Like, Allah, prices are rising, inflation, life is getting very difficult, I need to own a house. He's tempted, he sees a line in front of him that's very long, why not? Why shouldn't I join the list and join the line? When you're suffering of this problem or being tested by this fitna, Two or three words in the Quran will solve it for you if you read them with the intention of guidance. Allah Azza wa Jalla says, "Wa ahalla Allah al-bayah wa harram al-riba." Allah is the one who legislated business transactions and sales, and He forbid al-riba. Wa harram al-riba. These two words are enough to deter the believer from this line that he is lining up at in the bank. Wa harram al-riba. خلاص. My Lord, the one who created me. The one who revealed this book for my own goodness and benefit is telling me he forbid a riba, meaning there's no goodness in it. Let me walk away from this line. That's someone who's reading the Quran for guidance. Meaning, this person prefers what Allah is saying over that which his nafs wants to do. That's sincerity, man. That's honesty in your relationship with Allah. That's being guided. You know, in Surah Al-Fatiha, every day we read, Ihdina al-Surat al-Mustaqim, right? 17 times a day. Ihdina al-Surat al-Mustaqim. It's a dua, right? You're asking, oh Allah, guide us to the straight path. But did you know that Allah has already answered this dua? Did you know that or not? Who knew? Who knows that Allah has answered this dua already? And how did Allah answer it? Does anyone know? No. And we're reading the ayah 17 times a day. For the last 20 years of your life. Ihdina. How did Allah answer dua? How did He guide us to the straight path? The next surah, Surah Al-Baqarah, tells us exactly how. Alif Lam Mim. ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ هُدًا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ That is the book in which there is absolutely no doubt in it. It is a great guidance for the believers. You asked, Ihdina, here, Hudan, I gave you guidance. Here is the book. Al Quran, this is it. You cannot detach your Ihdina Salat al Mustaqim in your Salat. You cannot detach it from the Quran. This is why we read Quran after Al Fatiha. This is why. يعني إن صلاة العصر first two ركعات صلاة المغرب first two ركعات الفاتحة is recited and then something of the guidance is recited this one that you asked for this is what it is that's where your guidance is إن هذا القرآن يهدي للتي هي أقوى this Quran guides to the upright path in every aspect of life whether you want to be a perfect father he is the guidance 
A perfect mother, he's the guidance. You have to be a good leader, he's the guidance. You want your finances in line and in good shape, he's the guidance. What is it in life that you need? It's all in here. But we read the Quran incorrectly. We don't read it for guidance. The first thing you have to read it for guidance, then follow. I give you this. Live with me these ayat. Adam alayhi salam lived in the paradise, yeah? That's where he lived. That's the same paradise that you and I are always crying out to Allah for. He was already there. طيب, then he ate from the tree. He disobeyed. Allah forgave him. But there was a consequence for that. Allah Azza wa Jal, he said, minha jami'a. Yalla. Adam, Hawa, and Iblis. Come down, descend from the paradise. Wallah, you don't understand. You don't know, we'll never be able to understand the emotional aspect of this. How depressing is that? He, he was in the paradise. This one that we always want. You one that we've been asking Allah for all our life. And we cry when we ask Allah. For. He was there. He's coming down. Where? Here. To doubt a shaqa wal bala, a life of calamity and difficulty and worry and misery and stress. Can you understand what kind of depression there is involved in this? This is where death started. This is where sickness started. This is where old age started. This is where oppression started. This is where everything negative you can think of happened. He's going from there to here. But you know what Allah said? Yeah, you know, he's in darkness. It's like there's no hope. Losing hope altogether. Allah Azza wa Jal said, فَإِمَّا يَأْتِيَنَّكُمْ مِنِّي هدى. He said to Adam, wait. Any guidance that comes to you from me, Allahu Akbar. Heather, this guidance is like light in this darkness, in the oppression, in the fitan, in the sins, in the sicknesses, in the diseases, in the troubles, in the calamities, in the worries, in the hardships. <laughs> yes, I'm sending you down to earth, but wait, there's hope. Don't lose it. Any guidance that comes to you from me, Allah said, فَمَنْ فَمَنِ اتَّبَعَهُ Anyone who follows my guidance. Shuf. Allah did not say anyone who reads my guidance. Reading is not enough. Anyone who follows. Yani, the ayah is in front of you and you're walking behind it. Meaning you're implementing. He will never be misguided and never misled. And he'll never be miserable. He'll always be content and happy, no matter what his situation is. Even if he became bankrupt, even if he got divorced, even if his children died, even whatever calamity he went through, he will never ever be miserable. He might go through a lot of calamities, but this, there will be peace and contentment and acceptance. Why? Because the Quran teaches him this. Doesn't the Quran teach? to remain patient in a moment of calamity and how to connect to Allah and how to read the calamities. Read them as love messages from Allah Azza wa Jal. They are not Allah's punishment upon you. This is Allah cleaning you with them, purifying you with them. How can you shift your attitude and have this attitude if you don't read the Quran and seek guidance from the Quran through a calamity of yours? Allahu Akbar. فَلَا يُضِلْ وَلَا يَشْقَى It's the ID, you know? Look, uh, يعني, people have trouble with waking up for Salat al-Fajr. Eh, there's an ayah in the Quran that will solve your problem if you read it with the intention of guidance. And there is no other than one Fajr. One ayah, one word would solve your problem. If you say, I'm reading one Fajr, but I'm not praying al-Fajr on time, I say, you're just reading it, you're not following through. Allah said, فَمَنِ اتَّبَعْ The one who followed my huda, he will never be misguided, he will not be miserable. But then my brother, sorry, you're only saying one fajr, but you're not following through. What's going to make you follow through? Read two ayat before one fajr. What's two ayat before al fajr? Huh? Yani the surah before, what were the last two ayat of it? 
الله أكبر إن إلينا إيابهم ثم إن علينا حسابهم والفجر إن إلينا إيابهم الله is saying verily they will return to me everyone's going to return to Allah one day ثم إن علينا حسابهم and after you return to Allah we're going to hold them to account and judge them والفجر I swear by الفجر it's going to happen I tell you something you know the time of fajr it is similar to the time of resurrection when people are resurrected from their graves and get up from their grave what do they get up for people get up on the day of judgment from their grave only to walk to allah for al hisab there's nothing it's not a time of work there's no businesses there huh? there's no children to get them ready and take them to school there's no phone calls at that time. There's no food at that. There's nothing. You are purely getting out of your grave and walking straight to Allah. خلاص الحساب. Then either paradise or Jahannam. We ask Allah Azza wa to save us. Al Fajr is exactly like that. What time is Al Fajr? 5:30. You wake up at 5:30. When you get up at 5:30, this is not a time of eating. It's not a time of dropping off children to school. It is not a time of business and taking phone calls and responding to emails. And it's a time people are sleeping. So whoever, see, people are sleeping and they're in their graves. They haven't resurrected yet. The one who gets up for Fajr can only get up at that time for Allah. You cannot mix it with anything else. It's the most sincere prayer of the day. Chuf. And they are reading these ayat inna ilayna iyabahum thumma inna alayna hisabahum wal fajr. You know what the shawkani rahimahullah he said? He said, the one who doesn't get up for salat al fajr will panic and struggle on the day of judgment when he comes out from his grave walking to Allah. Because he was never used to this walk in this world of life. He wasn't used to it. So he gets up worried, panicked, struggling, scared, terrified. And wait, well, this is the first time I ever get up. And I'm walking to Allah. I never did this in my life. Like in the one who used to do it during his life. And got up for Salat and Fajr. Walked to the house of Allah. Lined up among the believers and prayed Fajr with them. And Allah will help him. On the day of judgment he comes out from his grave. Happy and excited. I've done this before. I know the drill. There's nothing for me to worry. I always used to get up lillah. At this time, when people were dead in their beds, I'd get up, لِرَبِّ Alameen. So what's different for me now? I've gotten up from my grief and I'm walking, لِلَّهِ رَبِّ Alameen. See, when you do that, inspired by these ayat, and they become a reason for why now you will get up for Salat al-Fajr, now you're reading the Qur'an with the intention of guidance. And now we've corrected our recitation of the Qur'an al-Kareem. Otherwise, we're just reading. We're not following. And that's why we suffer. And there are plenty of examples that can be given in this regard. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, and of course you all know that Al-Quran is called Al-Dhikra, the reminder. Why? Because the human being forgets. You can't even remember what you ate three days ago. You think you're going to remember the message of Allah from the beginning to the end of the Quran without reading it? That's another reason for why we read the Qur'an. To remind ourselves. I tell you, you can't remember what you dressed a week ago. Can you remember what the color of your short was, shirt was? No, Allah, you can't remember. You think you're going to remember 604 pages in the Qur'an without reading and attending to them regularly? Like I give you an example. You see, this is an Apple phone. How famous is the Apple phone? See, this is in everyone's pocket. This is not, yeah, I need to... Um, put down the Samsung, but Apple, Samsung, whatever it is, these fam famous phones. Why does the Apple company find the need to spend millions and millions and millions of dollars in marketing their Apple phone every single day of the year across the globe with massive billboards and banners? Just, just the phone is there. I mean, why? Why do they feel the need? That we have to plaster our phone and spend millions of dollars advertising it to people. Who's going to forget Apple? Who? 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 Look, like, it's in your hand and in your phone every day. It's in your pocket every day. Like, you might 
At the, you might figure, يعني, if you walked out of your house without the mobile in your hand, you'll remember the mobile in the house more than you'll remember that you left your child in the house. That's how attached we are to the mobile. And they find the need to always remind you about it. So what does that mean? What does that mean? We need to be reminded of the Quran. We need to pick up the Quran and read every day to see what Allah's message is. You know, the one who read ayat about Allah's punishment today is more careful in keeping away from a sin than the one who read the ayat of the hellfire last Ramadan. Because he forgot. He forgot. Naturally, human beings forget. The one who read مَا يَنْفِضُ مِنْ قَوْلٍ إِلَّا لَدَيْهِ رَقِيبٌ عَتِيدٌ Every word you speak, there are angels that are writing and recording. The one who read this ayah fresh today, he'll be more, more careful in what he says and what he comments as opposed to someone who read this ayah a year ago. Because it's not, it's not fresh, it's not alive, it's not working in his heart and mind. It's not there. So we are in need of reading the Quran to remember, to remember what Allah has told us, remember our guidance. Wallahu alam, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our gathering, to forgive our sins and our shortcomings and to guide us through the Quran. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to elevate our rank and to purify our hearts. إنه ولي ذلك والقادر عليه صلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين.